for coming to a special uh, Abney luncheon. I have to say, we have, I have no shock given who our speaker is today that we have a packed house. Um, it is our pleasure to have Jan Lieber here, the Chief Development Officer of the MTA, a dear friend of Abney, uh, as our guest to talk about how the MTA is working hard to rebuild and expand our, tram our transit system. Now, I love Jano, and I imagine a lot of people you here feel the same way. He is a unique and special person. He is both an optimist and a realist at the same time. He is deeply ethical and immensely capable. These are all traits one badly needs for the job that he is doing. I'll say, uh, um, he has some pretty weighty things on his plate. For starters, the transformation of Penn, of Penn Station. And I'll say this is the cover of Newsday today. I know not many, as many of us see Newsday as we used to, uh, but it says Penn Station $600 million makeover and is a tribute to the great work that he is doing, uh, as well as everyone on his team at the MTA. He is working on the second phase of the Second Avenue subway line, east side access connecting the LIRR to Grand, to Grand Central, enhancing rail access to our airports, and rationalizing the construction rules and processes at the MTA. Uh, I know Jano from the time he spent uh, working at the World Trade Center with another great New Yorker, Larry Silverstein. Jano was a true force of nature and perhaps the biggest unsung hero of that massive rebuilding effort. He managed everything from design and construction to legal and community relations for a project that, while worth billions of dollars in commerce to us in New York, something that is incredibly important, at the same time was probably worth even more in pride to our city recovering after 9-11. He has served in the Clinton administration as an assistant secretary for transportation. He also served in the Koch administration, I guess when you were like 10? <laughs> um, that said, in short, he is perfect for this job at the MTA, and we're grateful to have him here. Before we start, I just want to rec rec uh, recognize a few people who are here, great New Yorkers, including our former mayor, David Dinkins. Yay. Our police commissioner, James O'Neill. <laughs> Manhattan Deputy Borough President, Matthew Washington. <laughs> Matthew, I know Gary LaBarber is here uh, as well. I'm not sure if you made it here today as of yet. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for what you do for our city. I want to say one last thing just about Jano. He's a Hamish guy. You try to talk to him about himself, and he talks to you about his work. You try to talk to him about how great the work is that he's doing, and he talks to you about the commitment the governor has made to getting it done. He's a person who does not like to talk about himself. He's a, like, he's a person who really likes to talk about the substance of what he does. I, I, you meet many in people life. I just want to say one last thing. I truly admire Jano. I think he has someone, he is someone with great grit, passion, wisdom. He loves uh, our city, and he loves his family. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here, ladies and gentlemen, Jano Lieber. So um, I, I, I'm, oh, it's always a treat for me to speak in front of one of my childhood heroes, Mayor Dinkins. I, I lived for years in the north end of, of Central Park, and um, I, I got to experience how the city began to change under his leadership and how we turned it around. And uh, so honored to have you here, Mayor. Honored to have the PC here who has who's done so much to continue New York's success, um, which we've all enjoyed so much about. Um, I thought this, I've been doing a lot of L-Train uh, outreach and open houses, so I, I thought I was going to talk about the L-Train because, you know, Steven Rubenstein is such a Williamsburg hipster with the, with the exotic facial hair and the, uh, um, the exotic drinks, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the topic he gave me, which is, um, you know, we're in the middle of a great debate about how to fix our transit system, and implicit in that debate is whether the MTA can and will uh, deliver major capital projects, as I say, better, faster, and cheaper. This is something that everybody wants to happen, and it was the subject of a board working group, um, which I staff, and which was led by Scott Reckler, one, a great New Yorker who's very active in our ci civic community. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit today about um, what we're doing at the MTA to prove that we deserve the public's trust in building big, complicated projects on time and on budget. We have a long way to go. 
Um, but I do think we're making real progress. And case in point, two projects that uh, came in a little bit under the radar for New York City people, but um, Cortland Street Station. I watched the Port Authority and the whole uh, public sector struggle with that one aspect of the World Trade Center project. Obviously, there are many challenging aspects, but the Cortland Street subway station, which is smack dab in the middle of the World Trade Center, was literally the orphan project. It bounced around among agencies. It was constantly being changed in design, and the schedule was basically non-existent. So I was able to come in about uh, a year ago, and a little more than a year ago, and in less than a year, we got that project done. We were able to transform how it was done into a model of cooperation between the different branches of the MTA, and that's one of the serious challenges that we're taking on as we try to fix it, and delivered the project six months earlier than the scheduling pros anticipated. And it has, you know, for someone who had worked at the World Trade Center for 14 years that I had, the fact that it has an incredibly elegant art piece which speaks to the, the history and values represented at the Trade Center, but doesn't compete with the memorial, was also a point of pride. A second project that I think typifies what we are already starting to accomplish is the Double Track Project. There's a 13-mile strip on the Long Island Railroad, very, very busy between Farmingdale and Ronkonkoma, which is single track. The Long Island Railroad was built 100 years ago when there were something like 40,000 people living on all of Long Island, and now there are 3 million. So all of these lines uh, have to be brought into modernity. And this is a huge piece of Long Island's economy. Remember, Long Island has lost its manufacturing jobs like most of, uh, much of what's happened in the city, and they become more connected to the knowledge economy in New York City and more dependent on the railroad and the connections that it, that it brings. Well, on that double track project, putting an entirely new track, uh, signals, power, everything you need to run a railroad over 13 miles, we used design build, we, and we were able to deliver it 14 months early um, with aggressive scheduling strategies without getting too complicated. That was, that was a man bites dog moment, given the fact that nobody expects uh, MTA projects to come in more than a year early. And now we're modeling a lot of these innovations on the so-called third track project, the densest uh, section of the Long Island Railroad with close to 300 trains a day. It happens to be the area where that terrible crash in Westbury happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and third track, which will, again, add a track, all the other infrastructure, and enable, together with east side access, a 45% increase in Long Island Railroad peak hour capacity. That's transformational for the region. And it matters for New Yorkers. You know, there is a lot of talk about separating the subways and the railroads, and I get it. But let's not forget that New, that New Yorkers are increasingly using the railroads both to get into the center, the C CBD in Manhattan, but as much to travel to job opportunities in Westchester, in, the, in, in, in Connecticut, in Long Island. It's a bigger and bigger piece of our transportation system and our regional economy. But I will talk a little more about Third Track because it's a model project. So the L train. Um, I had some quality time in the L train this week, tunnel this weekend, and everybody's got this project on its mind. And as you know, um, it, it's been talked about in many different ways, but one of the ways that, that Governor Cuomo's uh, uh, change of direction uh, has delivered for us is that 275,000 people who ride it daily are not going to be inconvenienced. They're not going to have to change their travel patterns. The closings are going to be limited to, to not, the reductions in service, not really closings, the reductions in service are going to be limited to nights and weekends. And, and how we did it, I think, is typical of the bigger approaches we're using, which is um, we're, uh, being, we're simplifying the design, and that's something that's got to happen in all of our projects, um, using new technology and aggressively managing schedule. And that means looking for opportunities to piggyback work, looking for opportunities to do work earlier so that you can, predecessor activities that are dependent on each other can be accelerated. And that's how the L train's being done. It's not some exotic change. The work is actually pretty straightforward. Um, Sometimes, you know, it's challenging in scale, but this is not an exotic project. This is a project we can do, and there's no reason to have a whole neighborhood left without mass transit service. Um, 
Good news about the subway, which is um, hard for all of us cynical New Yorkers to accept sometimes, but the subway action plan is working. Uh, we've actually, you know, collect between the state and the city, invested 800 plus million dollars in the last year. And in January, on-time performance was up over 30% versus last year. Major delays are down by 50%. Um, and weekday major incidents, those are the incidents I think you all remember we started to hear about in the summer of 2017, incidents that caused 50 or more trains to be delayed um, are half what they were a year ago. So we're seeing significant results of investment, and that also, I hope, will give the public more confidence. But we still need to do a lot more than just the fix that the subway action plan represents. We need a major reinvestment strategy, and why? Well, subway ridership grew by 53% in the last 20 years. Um, we're projected to add over 700,000 jobs region-wide in the next 20 years. And meantime, real investment, inflation-adjusted investment in the system went down over 20 years, 8%. Remember, it started, um, uh, honestly, in the Pataki-Giuliani era, and then augmented by the reduction that, that took place in the, in the financial crisis. And we've only just started to dig, our, although we have the largest capital program we've ever had now, we've only just started to dig our way out of it. I don't have to sell this crowd, starting with Stephen, Stephen on, the, on the importance of mass transit. Um, and, um, but we really do need to collectively make a decision that we're going to rebuild the system. And it starts with congestion pricing. I'm not going to spend time on it, but that is the first, uh, the, thank you, uh, <laughs> the, first, the first hint. Um, that, that, that's really the building block of a capital program that's worthy of the goal of rebuilding the system. And, you know, not only is our workforce growing, but we have a lot more. The good news is we have people in neighborhoods which had, used to have a much lower percentage of people working and traveling to jobs, actually employed and traveling to jobs. That is good news. That's part of the success that New York has achieved in the last uh, generation. But we need, to, we need to have more mass transit. And the travel patterns are changing. There is so much more travel between boroughs and two boroughs, the non-Manhattan the non boroughs, as, as we in Brooklyn call it, the better boroughs. Um, uh, than there used to be, and we have to invest in the system so that we can meet that demand. So each of our three major operating agencies, Tr New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North, has a detailed plan of how they want to improve service, and you can look at it. I think they're compelling, but we cannot give way to the idea that we're just going to fix the system and stop investing in new services. Um, we have to as I said, meet the needs of a growing population and new travel patterns. So projects like Metro North to Penn, which is portrayed there on, uh, on the, uh, the, the left side of the screen, which is going to take an underutilized Amtrak right-of-way. It's the, Met the Northeast Carter right-of-way that brings, you know, two Acela or North Amtrak trains into Penn Station per hour and put Metro North on that line, running many more trains and all of a sudden serving the whole East Bronx People in Co-op City take an hour, a bus that takes an hour and a quarter to get to Midtown. People in Parkchester going through the same thing. All of a sudden, they'll be able to be in Penn Station in half an hour or 40 minutes. That's transformational. We have to invest in neighborhoods that don't have mass transit service as well as those that do. And part of what makes me excited about that project and others that we're working on is what it's doing is it says you don't have to build a new tunnel. We, ha we can squeeze more out of our existing infrastructure. So let's, let's use that project as a model and think about how we can uh, get funding both to rebuild the system and to make new capacity investments. But there's no question that, again, the main topic that I wanted to cover today is that MTA costs have over time spun out of control and the unique scrutiny given to transformational projects like Second Avenue Subway and East Side Access has highlighted uh, the need to address this problem. I mean, obviously, those projects are good investments. As we saw with the Hudson Yards opening last week, they can be truly transformational. The extension of the number seven line being one of those uh, incredibly large mega projects, but we need the public's trust. So how to diagnose the problem. Um, there's no ba magic bullet. And I apologize in advance to those of you who are not transit geeks for some of the detail I'm going to get into briefly. But 
the, the, there are specific diagnosable problems and we're taking action to address them. And those are the, the MTA cost premium that contractors apply, lack of competition on bids, insufficient accountability at MTA officials level, too much red tape, weak project management, and insurance costs. So let me take them on one by one. The MTA risk premium. We ask contractors to assume risks that are fairly unconventional in some cases, and they charge the MTA a premium for it. For example, our standard form of contract says that the MTA, if there's a dispute with the contractor, the MTA gets to decide who's right. Now, you know, what kind of judicial legal system uh, uh, is it when one side gets to decide? And, the contra and, and I'm not saying that the MTA administers that unfairly. They do their best to be fair. Uh, the so-called chief engineer provision, because it's the chief engineer who decides. But the contractor knows that he or she is at risk, and they're going to charge you a significant premium for it, um, between 10 and 25 percent by, by some accounts. So we are changing the contract, the MTA form of contract, and we're going to have a single neutral arbiter or state court judge to decide all disputes going forward. Delays. Interestingly, in, in the past, we, the MTA made contractors responsible for risks associated by delays caused by other agencies of government. If you're in Long Island, there's towns, there are villages, there are fire districts, there are police districts, and so on. And the contractor has to bear that risk. You can imagine the premium they charge you for that. Um, environmental risk. We habitually uh, ask contractors to assume risk for hard to quantify issues like environmental hazards and utilities that not being removed. So in each of these cases, you are getting a contractor to give you worse case pricing. That's the truth. When you do that with your contracts, and the first time I got an M, a, a, a Port Authority contract, which ha had some of these similar provisions, and I was a private developer, I said, this is crazy. This is a mistake, right? And of course, it wasn't. And I had to live with it and charge them a premium. Uh, so this is something that I think that solution starts with leveling the playing field so that there is not this imbalance, which is a uh, cause of a premium. Lack of competition. There, there are, one of the beefs that I get from our board is, why are we seeing the same contractors again and again? Well, we have provisions that actually chase contractors away. Um, we put them at risk for track outages. They could plan to get work done on the track. And they show up with their equipment and their personnel, and they're ready to go, and we cancel it, sometimes for legitimate service re reasons. But if they bear that risk economically, they will charge you a significant premium. And that's something um, that we're addressing. We, on the third track project, are guaranteeing track outages with a small contingency that we can, we can cancel. But after that, we are responsible for the contractor's cost. And in fact, we've created a, a, a system where the contractor has to if he wants to buy, it, it wants to get additional outages, he has to give a very significant payment to the railroad um, to offset the impact of that. So each of the MTA agencies is, a, is moving towards a guaranteed track outage policy. It's a work in progress. Bonding. We charge 100%. We require contractors to have 100% bonds on everything. When you have a big MTA job, if you say, I'm going to do that job, you're basically for many contractors, you are, I, you're, you're saying, I won't bid on anything else because I've used up all my bonding capacity. Um, so we are now cutting the bonding requirement in half on major projects, accepting other forms of security, uh, uh, corporate guarantees, letters of credit, and so on. And hopefully, that will induce smaller contractors to participate more. And subcontracting, you know, it's one of the things that we're all proud of is that uh, Governor Cuomo's direction that we become the leader in MWBE contracting. We have a 30% goal and we're achieving very close to that. But we have to administer this in a way that works better for the minority and women-owned contractors and for the whole project. By right now, there's a, 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 the, the, the courts are interpreting any interaction between the, the general contractor and the minority sub as somehow um, uh, potentially fraudulent or evasive of the MWB requirements. So you literally get situations where they can't work together, and that's causing delay. We have to deal with that. We need a 30% MWE program, but we need it to deliver for uh, projects as well. Uh, lack of accountability. The design-build system, which I think most folks in this room understand, the idea is that instead of having a separate 
architect and engineering outfit that designs the project, then you give it to a contractor, and then you spend years where the contractor and the engineering team argue over whose responsibility some of the problems are, right? Instead of that, you create a merge team. And on the third track project, uh, first of all, the design build was used on the Tappan Zee and the Kosciuszko Bridges, two huge projects that were delivered great, very successfully on time and on budget. And on the third track project, we used design build actually a two-step process where we went out, talked to the companies who were interested in doing this, had dialogue about how to reduce risk, how to allocate costs, how to work together and create a project that was appealing to them, and we got lower bids as a result. So um, where, where we're, among other things, we've created incentives for them to treat the public well. I mean, this isn't just good politics. This is a good project management. If you can convince if you can make sure that the public doesn't feel that they're getting beat up by a project in their neighborhood, you will have ma many fewer slowdowns. So we incentivize the contractor to comply with the 600 different commitments that were made to the public in the third track project. It's a, and, and so far, we literally have incentive bonuses for the ratings that local residents who live on the right of way give them. And so far, they're getting like marks in the 80s and, early, and low 90s. And the result is a much happier community on a very big project. So again, accountability and building it into contracts. OK, this is one of my all-time favorite charts. This is the diagram of a change order at one of the MTA agencies that will go not nameless. OK, it, Rube Goldberg never could have come up with this. Um, it, 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 it speaks for itself. On the, on the East Side Access Project, when I took over, we changed how we were managing change orders which are a necessary part of every project. Things come up, condi new conditions, challenges, uh, unexpected uh, design uh, issues. Um, and we knock down the number of people touching a change order from 17 to 4. And the result was the change order processing time is down by 70%. And we've cut the number of change orders in half um, in, in just a year. So this stuff is doable. This is not rocket science. Also on East Side Access, um, we had submittals, you know, shop drawings. This is a little technical. There's one of my great MTA colleagues. But uh, um, we had a we had, uh, huge backlog of submittals that we have to review design submissions. And, and um, it was a problem. We, we reduced the, the number that were outstanding more than 30 days by 85%. On, on the third track project, which as you can you've already figured out is kind of the model uh, that, that we're proud of. We're, we're in, we instituted an aggressive self-management program using key performance indicators. That's just a chart that we use on a weekly basis. Um, and this has resulted in 97% of submittals uh, being turned around in less than 21 days instead of the usual 30, and two-thirds being turned around in 14 days. Again, this is doable. This is not rocket science. What's definitely not rocket science is if you don't pay your contractor promptly, he or she becomes your lender, and they will charge you for it. And so we had a, we, the MTA standard policy, very typical of government agencies, is pay in 30 days. Um, that 30 days, though, is, doesn't real, clock doesn't start until 100% of the paperwork is in and the backup submitted. So in effect, we're, we're making it hard for contractors to get paid in 30 days. On our new co contracts, we've shortened the payment times until 21 days. And our position, and this is based on my private sector experience, is if for some reason there is not, the paperwork's not in, we will, we will pay a portion of the invoice at, subject to you know, the backup and the validation being done within a certain time period. If you fail to back up within two months, you lose the privilege of the early payment. I think that's an incentive for both of us. And on, on third track, um, we have, uh, two-thirds of our payments within 14 days. Again, hopefully contractors start to feel like, hey, working with the MTA, not such a drag. And finally, uh, or second to final, um, weak project management. Um, when you're developing, this is a Larry Silverstein quote, you know, when you're developing pro uh, a project, you got to be a good owner. That was Larry's, he always <laughs> talked about this, got to be a good owner. How do you be a good owner? Make decisions not change the design, and pay on time. And by this standard, the MTA is a very undisciplined owner, at least historically. Um, we have chronic scope creep. We have a, 
a big agent, big, these big operating agencies that somebody always has a new version of whatever the technology is. I want to change the design for this, that, or the other reason. And we, we, that, of course, just slows projects down, creates costs, and we have to be, uh, we have to be disciplined about it. The reason that happens, though, is that the people running the projects don't have the power to say no. And the idea that we've put in effect is the idea of a project CEO, a project CEO who has the power to say no to scope creep, the power to say no for demands for changes that kill costs and schedule, only to be overruled by the head of the agency. Um, it's very important because we, these big bureaucratic agencies have a lot of power centers, and you've got to make sure that the person, he or she, running the job has the power to preserve budget and schedule. Every one of our agencies is instituting Project CEO on their projects. And on top of that, Transit, New York City Transit, is revising all of its specifications so that we're simplifying. Instead of customizing everything, we're buying more off the shelf. If you remember Al Gore and the $20,000 hammer from the reinventing government debate, which was 20 or 30 years ago, we're doing some of that at MTA, and we have to simplify our design requirements and eliminate gold plating. And finally, um, we need to deal with insurance and workers' comp. I don't have a magic bullet here. This is a bigger problem, but let me tell you. On Eastside Access, the owner-controlled insurance program, which is the, the owner paying for all the insurance for the contractors, this is the standard in the business now, went from 4% construction value at the outset of the project to 8%, and it's rising. So we're talking about, on a big project, this is hundreds of millions of dollars of cost, and there are only two or three carriers in the, in the, in the city who will now write OSIP coverage. Workman Comp, as, as many of you know, has tripled since 2007, in part due to some of the, the legislative initiatives. So we have to find a way to deal with this. I, do, I am not an expert, but what I've been doing is creating huge incentives for safety on all of our jobs. It's good for people, obviously, not to get injured, but it's also good to try to create a track record where you are not, uh, where you're not uh, projected to have safety problems and large claims. And we need to figure out how to get workers to good medical care so they can get back on a job instead of um, when w the, the evidence is that when a worker stays home more than a day or two, that the probability that they're going to come back drops dramatically. So we have to get them to good medical care quickly if they're injured and start to reduce our costs. So um, this is just a couple of slides on what we did before and after with East Side Access and Third Track, what was wrong and what we are fixing um, on third track, uh, a little more evidence. But, uh, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to convey, and I apologize for some of the, the technical stuff, is this stuff is achievable. This is not uh, some, some, will not take, a, 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 you know, some exotic re reorganization of everything we do. Basic project management stuff. The private sector knows how to do it. You can institute it in the public sector. It takes some will. It takes some willingness to break, uh, to break China a little bit. Um, but I hope that with some more evidence of it, we will gain the support of people like you and the public, and that that will lead uh, to a, a capital program of the size that's necessary to build a subway system and a commuter rail system and a regional transportation system we can all be proud of. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Lieber. That was very interesting. Um, I've been in York and up for about 10 years. And um, if you could think back to um, the beginning of the Second Avenue subway and then to this point when we've, we've got shut and running, what were some of the best lessons learned in terms of the impact, whether it was displacement of businesses or individuals, gentrification, that we can um, hope that will be applied uh, in the next decade to come? So if some of the concerns are that East Harlem will change dramatically and not necessarily for the good, so what would you say to New Yorkers who are concerned about that? Well, first thing is that I think the Second Avenue subway is by any measure a great success. It's exceeded the ridership projections and uh, obviously inc been incredibly beneficial for businesses in that part of the city. Uh, the, the other thing that folks don't understand is that it's also reduced crowding on the Lexington Avenue line. The Lexington Avenue line, the, I, it's always amazes me just to say it, 
carries as many people every day as the Boston and Chicago subway systems combined. So the Lexington Avenue line is hugely overcrowded, and Second Avenue has reduced some of that. So that's all for the good. It is a successful project, although had some of these other challenges. What, what I, I would say about uh, East Harlem is the most transit-dependent community in the city, the lowest rates of car ownership uh, in the city. Uh, it is a, a community which has a very high proportion of NYCHA housing. And, that's, and, and everybody obviously is concerned that if you make uh, better transportation, there will, be, there will be gentrification or change. I think our first priority is to make sure that all those people in that part of the world who have, you know, were 50, 60, 70 years ago were promised a mass transit system when they tore down the 3rd and 2nd Avenue L's, actually get it. NYCHA housing residents aren't going anywhere. They are staying there, and the economic profile of that community is uh, unlikely to be changed. So we have, an op uh, I think, an obligation to connect those people to jobs and to education and to opportunity um, and to health care. So that's the, I think that's the principal reason for doing that. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of, of, of demographic change and housing change is one that, you know, that's not the MTAs to manage. The, the, the city council and the, and the executive have had a, a lot of debate about land use and otherwise how to manage that community. But I feel of an obligation to give those people the mass transit that's been promised for so long. Steve. So. MTA Capital Construction, which uh, you run, was created to primarily to manage the great mega projects that were disassociated from the current operation of the system. And that seems to be changing by the assumption of responsibility with respect to the L line. And I wonder if you could speak about um, is MTA Capital Construction now getting into the business of, uh, of capital projects inside the operating? subway system, what are the implications of that? What's the rationale on the other line? What are the implications going forward? I, I, I think the, 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 what I would say is there's no bright line. Uh, I understand that there may have been a bright line at the outset, uh, whenever it was in the early 2000s, but um, the, way, the way it has been administered si since I joined up is that we're trying to, instead of trying to create, well, this project's an MTA capital project, and that one's New York City Transit or Long Island Railroad, we're trying to create kind of a project management organization that exhibits some of the qualities and takes some of the strategies that you've seen here. And I've been running projects that include my direct report MTA capital team, but also Long Island Railroad people, New York City Transit people. So we're creating hybrid uh, teams that represent expertise from different parts of the organization in support of budget and schedule. It is a slightly different approach. The other thing that's going on, it's no secret, is that the mayor and the governor talked about, uh, as one of the elements of their 10-point plan, uh, which they issued in support of congestion pricing a couple of weeks ago, um, they talked about consolidation. So there is some discussion, not yet uh, resolved, about consolidating some of the, the capital project management functions that was in the 10-point plan, and, and we're starting to uh, move forward on, on thinking about how to execute on it. Um, when I see a chief development officer, I'm, I'm half expecting a phone call from my alma mater asking to <laughs> give me up for scholarship money. But um, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do any. <laughs> and then, and your your comment about uh, you know trying to standardize uh, you know the the uh, expensive hammers and all that sort of stuff. Actually, the national standards originally came from transcontinental railroads that wanted to make sure the tracks were all the same width so that trains could run across country. So there is certain value yeah. in making sure that we do have standards. Uh, I don't want to add to the bureaucracy. But the um, $40 billion question is, would you care to comment on the $40 billion question? Um, well, the size of the capital program is definitely above my pay grade. That's uh, the governor and the legislature to resolve, um, along with opinion leaders, like many of those represented in this room. Um, I, I can tell you that, you know, I, I, I can think of a lot of projects that um, are deserving of immediate attention that are transformational for neighborhoods that don't have mass transit, that will squeeze more out of our existing system, and that will deliver for, uh, you know, pushing us in the direction of a 21st century transportation system. We're trying to get to a 20th century, late 20th century system, but 
Um, so uh, it'll be decided elsewhere than this room, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about whatever they can do. I, I can think of a lot of projects that need it. Yeah, what's happening with the uh, use of Metro North tracks to provide more access to transportation for people in the East Bronx? Because I know that yeah. we're talking about that. Yeah. Seems like a transformative. Yeah, that, that, that project, um, where it is, is I think I mentioned, I showed a, a, a little map earlier that, that had it. It's, it's through the East Bronx, and so the stops would be Co-op City, Park Chester, uh, Morris Park, and Hunts Point. Um, and we're at the stage where we, we did an MOU with Amtrak. It was not easy. Um, uh, I have lots and lots of cooperation with Amtrak, and every one of those projects is complicated. They do things a little differently sometimes than we do. Um, but the governor actually stepped in and helped us get to the end on that MOU. We're turning that into final documents. I've got full design underway right now, and we're planning to start construction um, hopefully in the next year or so. so so that is really moving forward. It's a big, big priority and uh, exciting project because it kind of speaks to a lot of the themes that um, I've talked about. Also, not to be forgotten, people in those neighborhoods, um, the, the fastest growing portion of our regional transportation system is reverse commuting from the Bronx to Westchester and Connecticut. Um, that's great job opportunities for lots of people. Uh, Montefiore Medical Center huge medical facility, medical complex, has very little access to mass transit. They're dying for this. They're right around the Morris Park Station. So that's a, pr a project that I think could make a huge difference uh, for a you know, big, big section of the city. Thanks. Uh, the uh, transportation analyst, Elon Levy, has done some analysis showing that the Second Avenue subway came out at $1.7 billion per kilometer, where some recent subway projects in Paris, uh, Copenhagen, and Berlin were all around $250 million per kilometer. What do you think we should be aiming for in the next decade? I, 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 I will have to uh, take a pass on naming a number, but I, I, I would say that I'm not sure I agree with all of his figures and the apples to apples. But the overall point that we have to do better is real. And not only, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is key to accomplishing it. One thing I would say, one learning from the Second Avenue subway is that schedule and cost are totally interlinked. I have actually done a you know, forensic analysis of the Second Avenue project, where the cost went. And a lot of it was just the project duration, because the overheads for these big public projects are so great. So, you really need to like tighten the schedule, and what dragged that out was not, you know, just indifference. It was unanticipated conditions where they had to freeze the ground in some ways. There was a lot of problem with the real estate acquisitions uh, that delayed the project. You know, these are all challenges in big projects in developed environments, but you have to figure out how to manage the schedule uh, more aggressively because. Again, schedule will drive budget. It wasn't just the underlying construction costs that drove costs. It was the overall duration. The lady, nice lady in the back has been waiting. Hi. Um, I was really nice. Like, everyone was really happy with the L-Train, um, like, the solution that you found. And we were all very surprised how quickly it came about. What was it? Was it that uh, Governor Cuomo just stepped in and he was able to, like, masturbate anything happen? Or what David was talking about? Listen, I, the, um, the debrief on that, I, I wasn't involved with the early version of the project, and actually nor was I involved with the governor's evaluation, which he did with these academic uh, experts from Co Columbia and Cornell. Um, all I, would, I, I can tell you is um, the, the, the innovation, the principal innovation was not to demolish 35,000 linear feet of concrete bench wall um, and to use an, a modern system of stabilizing concrete structures and to leave it in place. And that is not, you know, rocket science. There is an additional technology innovation of man how do you monitor the condition of that concrete structure so you know if it ever starts to deteriorate. But it's, this is not, you know, rocket science. And we've been doing a lot of work on the weekends. Um, 
and getting ahead of the schedule, and I'm actually extremely optimistic. So, you know, it's no secret that the governor asks hard questions, that he is uh, skeptical of, of uh, conventional organizational solutions. Uh, in this case, that, you know, that predisposition was brought to bear strongly, and he came up with a solution which I think is on, on consideration, probably the right one, and it's so much better for the community. Now, which is not to say that it hasn't been, you know, disruptive for people who planned around the outage, and I understand why that has occasioned some controversy, but as far as an engineering and construction project, um, he made it a lot simpler and a lot lower impact for the public. Um, so yeah. you, you spoke about uh, getting more efficiency or capacity from the existing track, like these runs. Um, can you speak to the merits of the running at that stage? Uh, we're very interested in it. We want to study it as part of the next capital program. Through running is the idea that you have New Jersey transit trains and Long Island Railroad trains who would continue on past Penn Station. So hypothetically, you could have a New Jersey transit train which already goes and deadheads in Sunnyside Yard in Queens, continuing on and vice versa. Um, I, we have not, I personally haven't studied the heck out of it, but it clearly has some significant uh, benefits. The challenge is, you know, you start even a little bit to think about it. Um, the platforms at Penn are already, you know, somewhat limiting factor, right? They're already crowded and people getting on and off trains in the main destination. Could you have people waiting on the platform to get on? Uh, it's been designed as a terminal facility. Could it be turned into a stop? Um, that's one of the hard questions we'll have to figure out. And then there's a ton of others. But it's an idea that I think a lot of transportation professionals are interested in and we'd like to study further. I've had some conversations with the RPA who are big proponents of it. Sir. To follow on to that, I've occasionally seen MTA cars parked in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I wonder if cars that are might be going the other way. It, it, again, it's same, same point. Is it, it's possible that that uh, I, I don't even I, I don't know that actually that uh, that we're using parking lots in Hoboken for our, our cars. But I have pictures I can give you. It's right two occasions. Yeah. The past, it's, the, it's, the, it's the west of Hudson properties, the west of Hudson line in Metro North, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Jeremy Kroll, thank you for your service. Uh, could you share a little bit more about the vision for design build and where you think it might be applied in existing or future projects? I, 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 the, the governor and the mayor, I mean, you, you should look, look back at that 10 point plan, I think said that design build should be used on all major projects. So. The question is, where do you draw the line? Where does, what's the definition of major? Um, it, it, in my experience, it is design build it makes sense up and down the size spectrum. Sometimes you have a small project where you say you give it to a contractor and say, you design this stairway renovation. You know, go, you it's a design build project, even if it's small. So I, I, generally, it's been thought of as a tool for big mega projects. I think that we ought to be using it for projects of, of all kinds. Now, that there, there's, what you don't want to do is to create a situation where there are contractors who are not capable of also managing the design, who are therefore excluded from MTA work, and that you're actually narrowing your contractor pool. So that's the issue that we have to struggle with. But I don't think it's a matter of the size of project. I think it applies. It should be applied to all projects. Roger Hurd, the light that you talked about uh, through running, very concerned about current gateway plans precluding the possibility. And uh, there's a lot of details been done on this uh, recently. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Hurd is a this longtime distinguished uh, actor in the transportation area, and I have to say, I don't know the answer. Um, you probably know more about it than I do. I have not studied the gateway design and, and what it would imply. I think everybody, you know, would like it to be, um, you know, to, to facilitate through running rather than to make it impossible if that decide, you know, turns out to be effective in the future. But let me tell you, one thing I always say to people is that we've all focused on gateway and, and to their credit, Amtrak has made this very compelling case and the Port Authority and others is that this is, you know, a, a, an existential project for New York, and I think it is. But 
East Side Access, which has obviously a bad name because of its long and, and checkered history, is also a second way you know, to preserve our access from the I Long Island to the island of Manhattan. And the Penn Access Project, which we talked about through the East Bronx on that Amtrak right-of-way, is also a way to have redundancy for Metro North customers to get to and from Manhattan. Those are projects from a resiliency standpoint that are incredibly important in some of the same ways that we talk about Gateway. Uh, hey, John, uh, yeah. Governor came to have me about six weeks ago and said, um, sort of give me the ball, really put me in charge. And obviously, Corey has since announced a slightly different plan. Um, my question is, how much does bureaucracy and the complicated nature of the structure of it hinder what you try and do every day? Is it meaningful in your world? Yeah, I, I, listen, I, I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm telling anybody any, any news flashes that you know, when you're dealing with big bureaucratic organizations that have lots of different players and power centers, it's complicated. That's why you need a project CEO. That's why you need to give the people who are running projects the power to say, okay, thank you for your input. I, you know, I appreciate that you signed off the design. You can't change it from here on in. That, that's what matters to me. I, I, I don't, you know, in the public discussion about the MTA's future, people tend to focus on the big boxes, the governance structure. For me, it's more about who has the power to maintain project budget and schedule, who has the power to define what a project is or isn't going to be. Um, and that's what I'm pushing for, uh, you know, in, in the work that we do every day. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.